Okay, good evening, everyone. Although it's not the evening everywhere in the world who's on Zoom at the moment, I think it's the morning or the afternoon for some of you. Uh, here in London, it's six o'clock. My name is Nina Lopez, and I'm very glad to welcome you to this second event to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the International Wages for Hustle campaign, which coordinates the global women's strike. I'm from Argentina. I was born in Argentina and raised there, although I live in London. And where I met the campaign in 1976 and never looked back. So it's not 50 years, but nearly, nearly quite a long time. I'm very proud to be chairing tonight's meeting and this conversation between Selma James and Margaret Prescott, who I'll introduce in a minute. I want to make clear that we are discussing our track record as an organizing network and our organizing principles. We're not entering an academic debate. We stopped that really a long time ago. And what we've concentrated on is how to work together across different races, different nationalities, different sexualities, different incomes, all the differences that normally keep us apart. As Marx has said, philosophers have interpreted the world in many ways. The point, however, is to change it. And that really is what the Wages for Us for a campaign and the Global Women's Strike are about. I'd like to remind us all of all the people who have contributed to this incredible endeavor over the 50 years to our corner of the movement, but especially four sisters, four great campaigners who have passed away and who we want to remember and miss very much, especially today. The first one is Clotilde Walcott from Trinidad and Tobago, Ruth Tabasco, who was in Los Angeles, Lori Neum in San Francisco, and Andaya in Guyana. We remember you and we miss you. They would have been delighted to be part of this conversation today. Now, to say a bit more about the format, I will introduce Selma and Margaret in a minute, but and then there will be questions in the chat after they have their conversation and to feed into that conversation. But before then, I want to ask Barbara Vizi from the Bishop Gates Institute, which will be holding our archive, to say a few words. We are really delighted. It has disciplined us to put together this enormous amount of work of 50 years and hand it over to them so it will, it will be accessible to the public, which is fabulous. So Barbara, please. Thank you, Nina. I'm very happy to be joining everybody this evening. I'm uh, speaking from London as well and from Bishopsgate Institute. As you can see, it's a beautiful Victorian library. We opened our doors in 1895. Uh, at the time, this was a very poor area, but it was for anybody living or working in the, in the area who wanted to come and experience free concerts and lectures and courses. And we still do those and also, um, but now instead of it being a lending library, it's a special collections and archives. And we're extremely proud and happy to have the Wages for Housework archives coming to us. I've been cataloging them over the last couple of weeks and having uh, grown up in the seventies, it's been really moving and wonderful for me to work on these. Um, we have many other feminist collections that we're super proud of, as well as uh, lots of archives about London, labor history, social history, the cooperative movement, free thought and humanism, LGBTQ archives, and a lot about his, um, sorry, protest and campaigning. Um, we look after the collection of the English Collective of Prostitutes and um, the papers of a woman called Sue Sanders, who was co-founder of LGBT History Month. 
Uh, we have uh, the huge photographic archive of Format, which was a collective of women only, a women only photo agency. Uh, we have um, the family papers and um, artifacts of the Do three Dawson sisters who were suffragettes and educators. And that's just a tiny amount of the, of the women's studies and feminist collections we have here that we're super happy to look after. Um, and as I said, for me personally, uh, working on the archive has so far been a real thrill, uh, not only for its incredible importance as a resource for today's researchers, but it's because it's a living organizational network as relevant to today's activists as at any time during its 50 year history, I think. Uh, it's exciting for me to think about not just today's young women, but to imagine those of the future coming to Bishopsgate to learn more about and benefit from the experience of the women who've come before them and, and you know, really shown a light, a much needed light on inequalities and sexism then and, and now, and who continue to fight to make society fairer for everybody. Uh, I think that's all I'm going to say right now. Yeah, let's let's crack on. Oh, well, except that it's free and open to the public, the archive. Anybody wants to come in, you do have to book it at the moment because of COVID. But uh, if you just email us and I hope to see some of you on Sunday, if anybody is coming to that. Thank you. Barbara, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you. And we very much look forward to meeting you in the flesh on Sunday when we have our event here in London where we'll go through a PowerPoint with the various things that we've done over the first 10 years only. And we hope that many people will join us. Okay, to introduce both our speakers today, Selma James was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1930, raised in a movement household. She joined CLR James's Johnson Forest tendency at the age of 15. She later emigrated to London to marry him. From 1958 to 1962, Selma worked with him in the movement for independence and federation of the English speaking Caribbean. In 1972, having come back to London, she put forward wages for housework for the first time at the Manchester Women's Liberation Conference. And I'm sure she will tell you something about that. She calls for the classic, the power of women and the subversion of the community. In 1975, oh, and Women, the Unions of Work was her first piece where she put forward wages for housework. In 1975, she became the first spokeswoman for the English Collective of Prostitutes. And in 2000, she helped launch the Global Women's Strike, which the Wages for Housework campaign coordinates. She has a number of publications, but I'll mention the two anthologies, Sex, Race and Class, The Perspective of Winning, which is here. And we have a special offer for people who buy more than two or three books. And the other one, which came out last year, Our Time is Now, Sex, Race, Class and Caring for People and Planet. Now, let me introduce Margaret Presta. <laughs> who is the co-founder of Black Women for Wages for Housework and coordinator of Women of Color in the Global Women's Strike and an award-winning nationally syndicated journalist on Pacifica Radio. She's also the founder of the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders and co-founder of Every Mother is a Working Mother Network. She's the author of Black Women Bringing It All Back Home which was issued in 1980 and was the first book of its kind on women, race, and immigration. She's originally from Barbados and lives in Los Angeles. Okay, now it's, the floor is open for the two of you. Selma, you go first. Thank you very much. I'm great to follow the both of you. I'm glad you mentioned Johnson Forest because once I put forward wages for housework, in Manchester in 72, the road opened for me to start and to run and to build an organization for changing the world. And I was prepared for that to the degree that I was part of the Johnson Forest tendency, which you mentioned, 
which CLR formed. And um, I came in when I was about 15. So I was kind of raised politically in his organization. And what it did was to break entirely from all of the left-wing organizations, which uh, said that they were there to lead the working class. He said this was nonsense and we all agreed with him. And he said we had to build an organization as part of the working class movement, which was based on the ground up, that is on working class people who were grassroots, who wanted to change the world and who had ideas about how their particular sector, whoever they were, um, would find their own way of doing it. The, the fruits of that organization that are important to us today is that he told me to write a pamphlet on women because I was always talking about being a housewife and what the housewives in my neighborhood took, talked about and felt strongly about and I tell the story about how he told me how to do it by putting all my ideas in a shoebox over a period of time, opening them up and putting all the sentences together and having a pamphlet. Well, I followed his advice, not for the first time. And I did exactly that. And the pamphlet was called A Woman's Place. And it was very, uh, well received by a lot of women, beginning with the women in Johnson Forest, because they, they were the people that I first of all had to speak to, but also neighbors and women I worked with were interested. So that when in 1972, I put forward wages for housework, most of the women at the conference where I put it forward were very hostile to the idea of wages for housework, the idea that women should not necessarily go out to work because they felt in general that women's consciousness would be raised. Well, I thought everybody's consciousness would be raised if women had a higher voice and they would if they had some money of their own. And that the problem that women faced in the women that I knew in my immediate surroundings was that we were poorer, we had no money of our own, and we were responsible for giving birth to and training and bringing to the world the whole human race, but had no autonomy of our own. We were dependent most of the time on men, sometimes on welfare, but we were poor and dependent and producing the whole human race. And that had to be unfair. And it also had to be central to our condition as women, which we had formed a movement to do something about. So I, I beginning with Johnson Forest, beginning with the grassroots, we began to talk to um, women about the situation, but about their situation. And we found immediately, uh, even as we left the next conference, which where feminists had fundamentally turned us down, a woman came to me and said, look, they're taking family allowance away from women. And that's wages for housework, isn't it? Well, I knew that women got family allowance between uh, for every child after the first in the UK. And this was the first time I was brought to understand that it was threatened. And the idea that family allowance was for a form of wages for housework I hadn't really not thought of it. I hadn't, I hadn't understood all the ins and outs of wages for housework because 
I merely put it out and hoped to discuss it. And I saw immediately that we could form an organization, a network to fight to keep family allowance. We did immediately that day uh, started to organize together and we won. We won the money, but in the course of winning that money, we understood what that money meant to women. And even women who were against women having wages for housework, they had to agree that we had to fight to keep that money, that money that women said was the only money they could call their own. So that's how we kind of plunged into being an organization for women, for all women, and that only women in the UK had family allowance and in Canada, some women, women had a baby bonus and other Western countries, but there was nothing to women for women in the South. And in fact, women who were doing an enormous amount of work in non-industrial countries, uh, for example, in the whole continent of Africa, women did enormous work, not only reproducing the whole human race there, but also growing all the food. 80% of the food consumed in Africa in the 70s, now it's much lower, it's, it's 70%, but women are growing the food in most parts of the world that their families eat on a subsistence farmers as well. And they are not in any, they were not in any statistic um, that measured the work in that society. So we, we understood more and more about the international network that we had to build. At the beginning, we had Switzerland, we had Italy, we had Canada, we had the US, and um, we had France. And then we had other countries um, in, uh, increasingly, and today we have a number of countries, but also we have relationships with women in, in many countries. Awesome. Um, in 1975, we changed our num from, not name from Power of Women to Wages for Housework Campaign. And it was a very crucial moment. As soon as we said that and began to organize as the Wages for Housework Campaign, um, we had a different, we had a whole set of things that happened to us. First of all, that was the year when the decade for women began and the Iceland women came out on strike. And it was really the first general strike in history because most strikes up to them were of men and some women workers who worked outside the home. But, um, it was fundamentally a strike of men. This was fundamentally and absolutely a strike of women. And it was clear that there was a great potential for organizing internationally, which we really wanted to do because we knew that you could not be anti-racist really, unless you are international. So we were setting out to build an international network and to understand all the ways in which women are exploited and all the ways which were hidden from us, which women organized to fight against this situation and to um, fight for their families and to fight for even uh, for financial independence for themselves, but fight even in the great independence movement, the anti-imperialist movement, which was the largest movement the world had ever seen. And we didn't even know, we said we were women in a women's movement and didn't know one thing about them. 
Um, in 75, a, a number of things happened to us, but the most important was that a lesbian group said they wanted to, in Canada, said they wanted to be part of the Wages for Housework campaign, but they wanted to keep together as an organization. And so the Canadian women called us and said, what did we think? And we said, we think that's fine, but we don't want to be separatist in the sense that we are happy that they concentrate on lesbian women, but they are not to do that at the expense of attacking other women, uh, they have to take into consideration all the other struggles that women in the campaign and in fact in the world were doing when they organized for themselves to be autonomous within the campaign. We worked with them, we had discussions and we finally came to the conclusion that they would be most welcome. Shortly after that, Black Women for Wages for Housework was formed. Um, and the same kind of discussion didn't have to take place because we already knew that they would be most welcome, that would, they would transform the organization in a most wonderful way. But we would not, we would not accept separatism. What they did on their own behalf had to fit what had not to undermine what other women were proposing to do or were the struggles that they were involved in. And that was great. And they were terrific. And Margaret is, is no doubt is going to speak about that just now. But I have to mention that shortly after that, the English Collective of Prostitutes was formed within the campaign and had an independent existence uh, and under the same terms, autonomous, concentrating on their issues, but always aware of and supportive of other struggles that women and men indeed were involved in. But immediately there was an overlap between, le between lesbian women women of color and um, um, the English collective of prostitutes and soon there was US prostitutes collective as well. And these other organizations transcended the uh, countries and had connections in other organizations. Later, an organization of women with disabilities was formed within the campaign. And, uh, and single mothers have an organization within the campaign, autonomous, but, always, but never separatist, always strengthening the hand of everyone in the campaign. I think this is a good time that um, I can ask Margaret to make, to start with her presentation and then we can discuss further. There are a number of other points that I would like to make too. Thank you so much, Selma. It is really an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, with you. We've been through so much together for so many years. And as Nina has said, for me, it's not quite 50 years. The 50 years really is you, Selma. Um, I co-founded Black Women for Wages for Housework a few years after that. But I, I just wanted to share a little bit with, um, with you all about really um, what led me to Wages for Housework and what led me to co-found Black Women for Wages for Housework. And I really have to start um, by uplifting um, my family. My sister, by the way, is on the call. She's listening in today. My partner, my daughter, for all of their support, but also all of the ancestors that came before me on the continent of Africa in Barbados. I understand some in Ireland as well, because I hope that I have um, really earned what I think was expected, which is to work for justice and freedom. So I just wanted to open by saying that. 
and also for all of the villagers that I left at home in Barbados, my island nation of Barbados who are still there and all of my sisters and brothers in the Wages for House Rick campaign, the global women's strike, women of color in the global women's strike in the United States, but also in so many different parts of the world and, and growing um, in, in Thailand, in Myanmar, um, Haiti and, and others and, and always, always have to uplift uh, my sister and Daye, who would have loved to have been here today. So Nina, thank you for lifting her up and, and Clotilde and, and Lori and Ruth. I should say that um, part of what led me to Wages for Housework and to, and to grasp it, uh, not in an intellectual sense, but in a very practical sense, it's really my experience in the village, watching the way the women worked there, whether it was Nana Marson from across the street, who really was a full-time housewife, worked tirelessly, you know, for um, the nine or 10 children, I think uh, she had women who worked in the home and who also worked in the fields. And then there were some women who worked in town, but all of those women, whatever they did, their first job in the home, taking cooking the food and taking care of the children was a, an enormous amount of work. And of course they got absolutely nothing uh, for it. So when I ran into Wages for Housework and saw the butt that says Wages for Housework, I thought of my mother, I thought of Nana, I thought of all of those women in the village. I think I only know of one woman I know who didn't do housework. I had an aunt named Aunt Luetta, right? Up in Brayton's village. And that's because she had two sisters that did all of the housework and Aunt Luetta I think thought it was a little bit beneath her because she had a job in town but anyway that's that's another story um, also I think the story of being an immigrant um, coming uh, from my island from a small village my mother with three children in tow um, getting to New York City and having our family uh, divided and all of the emotional as well as other work involved in that um, some of you know this story that my family was divided and my sister and I wound up staying with an aunt in Brooklyn who happened uh, to our good fortune to be an activist in the civil rights movement and in Brooklyn core. Also, we, because of the movement for federation in the what was then called the West Indies, the Caribbean region, we all knew about CLR James because we would listen to the men in particular because they had a lot of time to debate. The women were busy um, doing housework, <laughs> um, you know, all of what was involved in that. Talk about him and talk about that movement for federation, the unity in the West Indies that we were so sad to lose. So when I heard about CLR James coming to, through New York City, um, I would go to hear him speak. And I'll have to say, I understood what he was saying as opposed to a lot of the um, my revolutionary leftist friends, I would be part of uh, reading and study groups and a lot of it, I really didn't understand. It really went over my head. And also none of it identified my experience or the experience of my mother, the experience of women in my village as anything to do with politics. Politics was something else. That changed when I met uh, and, uh, Selma James. And in fact, it changed when I read, before meeting Selma, when I read Sex, Race and Class uh, by Selma James. And if you read the anthology, I did the introduction of Our Time Is Now, you'll see that I argued for a while that Selma just couldn't be white. She had to be black because she couldn't have been that clear, especially on the issue of race. And of course I was proved wrong. She had good training in the anti-racist movement, the global anti-racist movement along with her then husband, uh, CLR James. But um, meanwhile, as a, as a young person, I was uh, considered myself a kind of a non-political sort of party girl on the circuit of, of New York City transitioning from a village girl to a, a city girl on self-discovery and autonomy. But then when I got out of uh, university, I started teaching in an inner city uh, school in Brooklyn, Ocean Hill, Brownsville. And that's where I got a serious training from welfare mothers. My mother had a lot to do with training me to be a teacher and understanding 
what that meant and the empathy and love involved in that. Uh, but it was really uh, those mothers who were making a struggle for open admission school, open admissions to schools in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. I don't have time to go into details now, but maybe in the discussion, I could say a bit more about that. But they were the mothers who were down at the school every day, who were making sure their children were taken care of. Then um, we realized that we needed to get a free breakfast program in the school, working with the Black Panther Party uh, to bring it in, but also pushing for accountability um, against the racist teachers who were in our school. Our school was mainly Black and, and Puerto Rican uh, children and protecting our principal who was standing up against them and being in support of the Afro-American Teachers Association. That was also the time that I was involved. You know, this was our cultural nationalist period, which was important in a lot of ways um, to, to, for many of us, because there are very few places in the world you go to where the, the darker you are, you're not discriminated against. Uh, that's just the, the reality uh, that we're finding. That is how race has been used in part to divide us. So there's a place called the East in Brooklyn. I understand there's a documentary film that's coming out about the East. Many of us were there hearing the great jazz singers, but also learning a lot about black history, about um, healthy food, organic food uh, at the time. So that was also part of the kind of political awakening that I was going through with the training. On the one hand, I was getting uh, from Welfare Mothers and, and then the gathering in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn uh, at the East. Then after I left um, the public school system in New York, I, I had the fortune of being hired into the SEEK program at the City University of New York. And the SEEK program was a program, it was part of what was won in the, op the struggle for open admissions in the City University of New York, welfare mothers being very much part of that struggle, by the way, even though that's very much hidden. And the SEEK program was specific for uh, low-income students, for students who had to um, really catch up and be able to compete in a four-year university situation. That was the SEEK program. And it was in the SEEK program that a lot of the faculty, that's where I met Ndaye, the great late Ndaye um, from uh, Guyana. That's also where I met the co-founder of Black Women for Wages for Housework with me, Wilmet Brown, brilliant woman um, who was a former Panther and who had uh, went to the continent to, to work on African, uh, with African liberation movements and had returned to make the movement in the US. Um, you know, when I met her, there were many others who were also at, at the SEEK uh, program, including the woman who founded uh, one of the founders of the Lesbian History Archives and others. We started a, a women's uh, study group and right away, uh, this was after we had run into a table of women who um, were in New York, who were involved in wages for housework and a huge debate and fight broke out about wages for housework. And um, myself and uh, my co-founder of Black Women for Wages for Housework were kind of accused of being gladiators for wages for housework. Um, and. I just have to say this too, that it was really, as I said earlier, reading sex race in class. Um, when eventually I went to London, it was able to meet Selma James and I was able to see that my experience as an immigrant, my experience as an, um, in my village, right? Um, my experience as a black woman, that all of this was a political experience. The study groups that I had sat in and sat with, and some of them were with some notable people, Maurice Bishop, of who eventually went on back to Grenada, became the prime minister, was assassinated there. He would come down from Canada and be part of a, a, a Caribbean-based uh, study group we had, and people were reading Marx and various things. And uh, frankly, I didn't really relate to, to any of it, but I definitely related to sex, race, and class. And I definitely related to wages for housework, given my experience in my village, but also in Ocean Hill, uh, Brownsville. Um, I'll have to say that 
you know, I also read um, Salma referred to a woman's place, which she wrote in 1952, I think. I think it was Selma. And it was really that book, A Woman's Place and Sex, Race and Class that got me interested in the Wages for Housework campaign. I mean, I read The Power of Women and, hey. and Subversion of the Community and I wasn't really too impressed with that, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, and, uh, and also I was a bit fed up uh, coming out of a civil rights movement, coming out of uh, the militant black movement that was on the rise of like, how as the black woman do I fit into this? I mean, you've had a bunch of white women in, in, in New York um, and experienced some, we experienced some racism there. I don't wanna go into the, the details of it. Um, the New York City and the Italian branch, uh, so to speak, of the wages uh, for housework, um, or people who identify with wages for housework. Um, but because we knew of the anti-racist training that Selma James had, we knew of her work, we knew of CLR James's work, and I was still Miss Skeptical. I was skeptical of, of white folks and white people, in all honesty, uh, with you, and figure like, well, people had to really kind of prove themselves if indeed they were anti-racist and if they were gonna be on my side. And I also noticed that in New York, the group started putting out information of, that reflected some of the work of the black women, but we weren't credited with it. We weren't identified with it. And there's no way I was going into a majority white organization, it seemed at the time, without some level of autonomy. So Wilmet and I, we borrowed the money. I went to London. I was a big fashionista at the time. Well, well, maybe some of that continued for a while with my big suitcases, et cetera, turned up outside Selma's house. Had to see for myself if she was the uh, real McCoy. And I'll have to say, if it were not for the, um, at the deep anti-racism uh, that Selma in her political life had been involved in, the black movement uh, she had been involved in, the anti-racist newsletter she was putting out, et cetera, and her work, likely Black Women for Wages for Housework never would have been formed. Um, I know the, uh, okay, I'm getting a, a, a thing now. I have just about three minutes or so for this introduction. Um, so even though there was interest uh, by my other cohort in coming into the Wages for Housework campaign, it had to be on the basis of autonomy. It had to be on the basis that we were autonomous as black women, but recognizing that we didn't wanna be separatists, meaning that we understood the difference between separatism and autonomy, but that the campaign also had to respect our autonomy. And we'll, Selma and I, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about autonomy and accountability. We also were attracted with the fact that uh, it was global because I came from the Caribbean region. My co-founder had roots also in Liberia on, on the continent. So we were kind of a mini international in and of itself. Um, uh, just to say it in wrapping up, and Selma, I'm so excited about this conversation. It's a little emotional uh, when you've spent so much of your adult life uh, building a movement that some unfortunately dismiss or try to claim or wipe you out. This has been the experience of a lot of women of color when history uh, gets retold, a lot of, of grassroots movement. But to say that it was really, uh, of course, with Selma being a founder, being a point of reference, but it was really the Selma working with the autonomous organizations, with us working with each other as Black Women for Wages for Housework, as Wages Do, the ECP, all of those. And a lot of people get confused because they say, well, are you really Wages for Housework because you have all these autonomous organizations? That's because I think they never understood Wages for Housework except as some theoretical idea. You know, the, the, the prisoner's rights movement in the United States, they have a phrase that says nothing about us without us. And I think in so many ways, Selma, that kind of expresses the importance of autonomy and what some of those who are still writing or claiming 
um, the campaign as part of their history never really understood. And that's one of the reasons that they get confused that you can have all of these autonomous organizations speaking in their own voice, but being together right in this campaign, the Wages for Housework campaign and the global women's strike. So I'll just end there, uh, Selma. Uh, congratulations to you, by the way, and to all of us who have made this movement together. And I look forward to us interacting a bit more. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Margaret. That's a, a good way to continue this conversation. Uh, because you said about um, about my, my, my concerns and also the fact that I never stopped being in the Black movement, I brought with me this cover of Race Today, which was a Black organization that was the first issue of Race Today being um, edited and completely organized by Black people. And it was the first time that Sex, Race and Class, which you spoke about, was published, was published in this journal and on the cover, it says power to the sisters. And I'm really delighted in preparing the anthology, the, um, the, the record of everything we're doing, the archive. This turned up and I remembered again, 19, January 1974, the new race today. And it, the cover says power to the sisters which was the way I signed off you know, of sex, race, and class. Um, I, we made a big experience with autonomy and are still making it, but we know a lot more than we did at the very beginning. And one of the things, Margaret, that we always noticed, and I know you're very aware of this, is that people who are personally ambitious they like separatism. They like to tell you that the people you're working with, that, that's not the ones you need. You need people who look only like me or who have only my sexual choice or only anything, because that means only he or she will go forward on the basis of a movement which they have not built or have not paid attention to. And that's one thing, ambition is the enemy, not only of autonomy, but of the movement. Ambition is using the movement to, to move yourself forward up the ladder, but nobody else goes up, only you and maybe one or two of your friends. And, you know, we got so, so uh, sharp about these things that within 10 minutes of somebody being at our women's center in London, we know if they're serious, if they're really interested, if they want to know more, or if they've come to find out if there's a room for their ambition to work with us so they become local council counselors or even MPs or in any case journalists who can report the real story that the that the grassroots doesn't want to tell or distorting it even though the the grassroots has fought very hard for what they have made clear and what they have established we're also very wise about the NGOs you know, we've worked with Haiti and supported Haiti because we believe that they have done a fantastic thing. They started and really led the struggle against slavery in the Americas, and they've never given, been given the credit that they deserve, uh, certainly by governments who want to subvert them. They don't like that those, those autonomous, really autonomous Haitians who refused slavery and fought and fight to this day to uh, continue to uh, not be slaves and to keep their uh, independence, 
they they never let them off the hook. And Margaret, you and Andai were the two Caribbean people that we, the Wages for Housework campaign internationally, sent to Haiti to celebrate the 2004 bicentenary of that revolution. And we were very delighted to be able to send you to that. And that was part of the autonomy that we supported. And we've never stopped supporting Haiti, not only politically, but financially. They need money. And uh, we've tried very hard to gather money for them. Um, what is this? Parties. What? Parties. Yes. I, I want to say something else about building this organization that we've built, Margaret. Uh, you have a bit of a different experience in North America, but we have really always consulted. You know, we had no money, but we put our pennies together to make sure that we had money for phone calls, which were very expensive at that time, so that we were constantly in touch with each other learning from each other, hearing each other's experience, finding out what you want so that we can advertise it here and telling you what we'd want or what we'd lost and learned from it. And every, every woman who came into Wages for Housework, into the campaign, brought with her a whole experience and changed the nature of the campaign. Every individual helped to build our understanding, our power, and, um, and the breadth of our, um, of our campaigning. And nothing was more truly that than Black Women for Wages for Housework, which changed its name to Women of Color because it, in 2000, when a number, a number of organizations updated their names to be more inclusive and more modern, the world was changing when Black Women for Wages for Housework was formed in Europe, especially in the UK, Black meant anybody of color. Even Turkish people refer to themselves as Black. Later, that wasn't true. And the name Black Women for Wages for Housework, why we keep it, because it did it, it made the break, it spearheaded the Wages for Housework campaign in many respects. Um, never, nevertheless, Women of Color talks about the Thai women, it involves the Thai women and the uh, Indian women and a great campaign in India against rape, especially by, um, by farm workers and others. Uh, they do fantastic work there. We, we hope to be bringing more of that to you as, um, as our telephone prices go down. That's part of what, and, and also the technology enables us to be with Manju Guardian much more than before. But one thing that we all shared at the, we were, did not want to replace the state with ourselves, ever, any of us. We wanted to change the world, not join the hierarchy at the top. And we did not accept in membership women who did not want wages for housework for themselves to say, well, for the poor or something. No, that's really not where it's at. We had some women from high positions, but they were women who knew that their high position was shaky as long as the rest of us were dependent and impoverished. And they fought with us because they were fighting for themselves and we that's what we wanted to see uh you all had um a, fa a fantastic victory with the um the movement uh, for um welfare 
which was so crucial, the single mother movement in the UK and in other countries is quite strong. And in the US, there was a massive women's movement, but it was led by black people, black women. And therefore the feminists did not acknowledge this massive women's movement. But of course, black women for wages for housework was part of that movement. And you did that thing in, uh, 1977, which was truly fantastic. You want to tell people about that? Yeah, and uh, I would like to say, you know, um, just going back a little bit, Selma, on the whole question of autonomy and also Black Women for Wages for Housework, which does coordinate uh, women of color in the way that the Wages for Housework campaign coordinates uh, the global women's strike, women of color in the global women's strike. But uh, Selma, as you were talking about the difference between separatism and autonomy, I mean, coming from the Caribbean region where the majority, I think about 90, Barbados, about 97% of the population is black. We were confused to think that because somebody is black, it meant they were on our side. There were plenty of scabs who were black. The Haitian population, the same thing. If you look at Baby Doc and Papa Doc, uh, Papa Dot, a dark skinned uh, black man. So people who run around with this idea that, you know, people who are on the same color of your skin are the ones that are on your side, you know, uh, clearly aren't looking at the Haitian experience, clearly are not looking at reality. And you're right, a lot of them um, use um, color as a way to guilt trip other people, to guilt trip other movements, push people around. And that has nothing to do with autonomy. And it also has nothing to do with winning. It has nothing to do with undermining this capitalist hierarchy that keeps us all down, but really in putting themselves forward. If you're gonna be ambitious, be ambitious for the movement. Be ambitious to put a movement forward and to uh, build uh, to build a movement. And Salma, one of the things you would love it in preparing for that, I actually found some documents that were handwritten. You you talked about the the struggle we made for welfare mothers in in the Seek program, but also at Houston, I found handwritten versions of Sapphire that we took to Houston. That you, Salma where we couldn't get support from the folks in New York to produce that newsletter to take to Houston in 1977 to the first congressionally mandated conference on women. You stood with us and insisted that we get it done and helped us to get the resources to get it. And, um, you know, I think there is a copy available that we could maybe show that a bit on the screen so people can see Sapphire. Um, the first newsletter of Black Women for Wages for Housework. Is it possible to screen share that? Um, if not, I'll just I'll just move along and maybe we could see it see it at it's another time. It's but definitely part of our archives. There it is. It's there part it of is. the archives, and there it's it is. These are some of, right. These are some of the things that you will see at Bishop's Gate and in in the U.S. at the uh, community archives we're developing. Thank you. And also we have the Seek the Seek petition that we did at the Seek program. And that's also in the archives. And I think we have a cover of that today. But while we're looking for that, Selma, here's one of the things we wrote back in 19, uh, I guess, 76. This is um, um, those of us that were organizing in the Seek program that I mentioned early for the right of mothers on welfare not to be penalized because they were in um, at, at Queens College because they were in the university. And we were, um, the men started complaining, the men in the left, like, what's the matter with you women? You wanna go off and meet on your own? You're going in the women's center, they're a bunch of I'm lesbians. Trying. We said, we don't care if we're a bunch of, they're a bunch of lesbians. Maybe we, we could develop some alternatives to y'all. But anyway, <laughs> we wrote, quote, we should meet as women because these are things that affect us directly. If the men were here, we would have to spend a lot of time explaining things, time we women have little of. We will take time to explain things to the men, to everyone, and see what they want to do. But there are things that we have to be the ones to do. We are at the bottom. They must listen to us for a change. 
that was kind of a putting out the, the salvo of um, about uh, autonomy. And then we also said, we in the Queens College Women's Action Group refuse to be driven back into our homes without a cent. And we refuse to be trapped into low wage jobs. As women, we already have one full-time job, housework. For us, being a student means taking the burden of housework with us, giving us two full-time unwaged jobs. Winning welfare brought us one stop closer to winning a wage for housework. Winning a seek stipend brought us one step closer to winning a wage for the work we do as students. Then we said, going to school is work. Um, the stipend is not a charity, it's a wage. No wage cuts, no more work. And that was December 21st, 1976, a handwritten document right here that then showed up and I'm sure will be uh, part of the archive. So Selma, I think that underscores what you have been talking about in terms of uh, the practical movement building, not just some idea but how it is put into practice. And then the work that we did in Houston, uh, Texas with the great leaders of that great women's movement, the welfare rights movement, the National Welfare Rights Organization back in 1965, Johnny Tillman, a black woman out of South Los Angeles who served as president of the National Welfare Rights Organization said, quote, if I were president, I'd start paying women a living wage for doing the work we're already doing, child raising and housekeeping, and the welfare crisis would be over, just like that. And she wasn't a separatist. She said housewives would be getting great wages too. And it was with Johnny Tillman, Beulah Saunders out of New York that um, Black Women for Wages for Housework, the Wages for Housework campaign worked together at the first congressionally mandated conference ever for women. This was during the UN Women's Decade. And we threw out a resolution that was a workfare resolution that required women, took away the right to welfare, required women to get a job outside the home in order to get welfare. We threw it out, we rewrote it, we opposed workfare, and we said that women receiving welfare should have the dignity of it being called a wage. And some and others who are listening, part of how we won that, by the way, because we were up against a lot, is that the Southern women, the New York, the Mississippi delegation sat behind the New York delegation. They saw us running around with our aprons that said every mother is a working mother. Um, and then they came over to find out what this is all about. We spoke about that and they listened. They didn't say anything. They got a little nervous when we mentioned welfare. But I could tell you, and that welfare resolution came up for a vote and Beulah had already threatened the feminists. She was like, y'all better boogaloo down and stand up when this welfare resolution comes up. So she was working them. I was doing the work with the, with the, with the Southern delegations. When Mississippi stood up, Alabama, Tennessee, all of those Southern states stood up. They stood with black welfare mothers. And that was a victory that we won in a bipartisan uh, matter. That was a different time than, there, than it is now. But you asked about uh, Houston Selma because after that victory, we went on to do the work we did uh, together in the UN. And we were on the phone to you in London <laughs> We were doing that work in Houston. We wanted to put out a press release. I can't even find the damn press release, but you were definitely, you know, helping us because we were running around with getting the typing done and for helping to formulate language and all of that. So even that yeah. was an international struggle. One last piece I want to say about the welfare rights movement. You know, I'm on the board today of the National Welfare Rights Organization, and they insist on being multiracial. They, they, they don't want any business to do with, with separatism. And, you know, they are the movement. They, they, it was because of them that Martin Luther King began the, the Poor People's Campaign, the first Poor People's Campaign. There's now a second Poor People's Campaign that is, that's going on now. And it was when King met, met with Beulah and Johnny Tillman and them, and they said, Dr. King, if you don't know what's going on with us, you better listen. And he listened to them. And as a result, we got the Poor People's Campaign and his focus on, uh, on economic justice. But the mainstream feminists, as we call them, they never acknowledge this movement 
Selma, as you always have insisted on, this was a women's movement. It was led by black and brown women, but it was a multiracial movement. It is still here today. And I think there's a link for the website of the uh, National Welfare Rights Organization. Um, well, I'm not quite sure how we're doing on, on time, I know. So the chair should, should just tell us to shut up when we need to shut up and get some questions yeah. going, but we could continue because <laughs> there's, there's so much to discuss. We haven't so even much. got to the yes. one thing, Nina, you, we may be talking about the first 10 years now, but it's 50 years. It ain't just no 10 years. So every few months, we're going to be launching the, the, the next decade of our work. Yeah, Thank that's you. it. I was going to announce that at the end that we're going to have a whole set of other panels. We have to have an international panel. We have to we have to show all the all the you know the, the how wide ranging our network is internationally, the different countries involved, Thailand, Ireland. Peru. By the way, there's a message from Lady Mosambite from the Federation of Domestic Workers in Peru, who is the coordinator of the Global Women's Strike. They're congratulating us on our 50 years. That's because she joined. She didn't join 50 years ago, okay? But she's been with us for quite a lot of years by now and doing fantastic work. I just wondered, you know, it would really be good to also discuss uh, the whole area of how wages for housework led to a care income and, and, uh, and the global women's strike and the, th the slogan that we've used in the global women's strike to, to kind of uh, sum up our perspective, which is investing, caring, not killing, which is you feel more and more relevant as we, as we go from one war to another war, one coup to another occupation. You know, we're now with Ukraine, but Palestine has been ongoing for decades. And Selma, I forgot to mention that you are a founding member of the International Jew Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. And I saw that the founder of it, Sarah Kirshner, was in fact at this um, webinar. She has, she's had to go, but she, you know, she was delighted to be hearing from you. So I just wondered if you could both of you also address that whole issue of investing, caring, not killing, and the care income. And Stefania Barca, who we met, because she's also campaigning for a care income, is also on the call and has done fantastic work with us. Well, I, I think I first have to say that it was Bristol Black Women for Wages for Housework that really was able to help you all to prepare for Houston and for the great, the great victory that you have there, which has meant so much to us because what it meant is if you begin with the work that women are doing, they respond and that you say, this work is vital. This work is the central or should be the central work of society, caring for each other, caring for the planet, you know, that this is where the income should be going. It's not that mothers should be deprived, it's that mothers should be enriched and all the farmers who work hard to prepare the food and to protect the environment, they also are entitled to an income. And when we, first of all, in 1980, Clotilde Walcott, whom was mentioned, she's gone to a better place. Clotilde was, a, I met her in 1980. Within a few days, she was absolutely in the Wages for Housework campaign. And she formed an organization in Trinidad when she went back from the conference that we both were involved in. And she, she shortly after that, got the first bill passed in Trinidad and Tobago for women's unwaged work to be counted. And we went to, first of all, 1980 to the UN there. 1985, we went again more prepared for it. And we got a great uh, resolution passed for counting that work in national accounts. And finally, in 1995 in Beijing, when Andai, God, we miss her so much. You know, that we, we've been, 
advertising her book because it's a wages for housework book that she's left us with. And she was part of the government delegation of CARICOM, Caribbean Commission, and she helped us to win the, the resolution that women's unremunerated work, that's the big word they use at the UN, that work on the land, in the community, and in the home be measured, how much is it? and valued how much is it worth and that was passed because we organized margaret you're a brilliant organizer 1200 organizations which really represented thousands if not millions of women supporting our moves in, at the un and that's when clotilde saw that she got an mp um, in in the Parliament of Trinidad to pass a resolution, the first resolu resolution in the world passed by a government for a women's work to be measured and valued. And Clotilde was a grassroots woman who was dedicated to the movement. And she felt as we do, that this is the best way that you, to spend your life fighting for the world to change and for people and caring to be central rather than profits and the market. And she was dedicated to that and we remember her always. Um, you know, and I helped us to get that resolution passed. And when we saw the possibility that wages for housework had influenced the um, the European um, grassroots. What is the name of that thing? The grassroots. The 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 plan. The, you mean Caricom? Do you mean no, Caricom? I mean, the the thing that's passed for the for the environment. The Green New Deal for Europe. Oh, we the Green saw, New Deal. We saw the possibility they said care income and never mentioned women so we said well wait a minute we have some ideas on this and we said the care income for those who care for people and the planet and this is what it means it means those of us who are carers those of us who are caring and and and, and protecting the human race also in in against injustice against wars, against exploitation. That's what we women spend our lives doing. And we want that to be part of the Green New Deal, not only for Europe, but for the world. Uh, and we've been working on that basis. And it's really, what it has turned up is movements of women, farmers who are trying to, remake the, the soil in, 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 in a number of countries. And the last one, by the way, we just heard about in the last few days in India, where um, women, women, tribal women have gained pieces of land with their name on it. The political party found it uh, that they could do that. And they were ready to do that. And the women had fought women in 25 of the hundreds of villages that are organized with Manchu's organization that um, they have the land and they're not using any of the poisons on it. They are transforming the soil and making it uh, to help to save the environment in India you know, about a million women in one state, but it's happening uh, clearly everywhere. That's in Chhattisgarh, where these other women are. And that's the saving the planet. A lot of the work that women do is precisely that. And what we have to advertise is how important this is to the society generally and it's really doing the protective work that we have always done. 
Yeah, and Sal Salma, picking up on um, on what you were you're saying. I mean, the talk about movement building to get that UN resolution for the language that we finally got in 1985, 1995, and now I understand it's integrated into some UN sustainable development goal. We never would have uh, thought that, and um, but we did that because we built a movement. I mean, so many of the women in the UK, in the US, Sydney and Anne and Kay and uh, Sarah and everybody were involved in building and, and circulating that women count, count women's work petition that got so many signatures that we then took to Nairobi in 1995. And with the support of some of the African nations, we got through because the United States was opposing it. And the countries of the global South were saying, look, this is a women's issue, we know, but most of the work done in the global South is un paid, unwaged work. And then they look at us as though we're charity cases when we're not. And then in 1995, we did go with the backing of 1,200 non-governmental organizations worldwide, it did represent millions of women. And we were a multiracial delegation of about 56 or 57 of us from around the world. And we lucked out with and I fought, I think, to be part of that uh, CARICOM uh, delegation, and CARICOM right. didn't object. But you remember how intense the work was, and I was on the inside. Selma, you were on the outside. I was running back and forth and saying, "Here's the latest language, Selma. Look at it. Make sure that it's exactly what we want. The comma is in the right place." It was really that kind of. Um, uh, collaboration included doing civil disobedience in China in a UN building, a silent protest. Remember that? So all oh, of that well, was I'll part and parcel. It. it was very uh, effective. It was very effective of winning that resolution. So you know what I mean? It didn't just happen as you know some people would like to say. I read somewhere recently that the UN happened to do this language. Well, the UN did it because we grassroots women were there making sure uh, that they did it. One other thing I wanted to raise too is um, that that UN resolution, Selma, get back to the inter interrelationship with the care income. We said, count and value the work in the home, on the land, and in the community. So the work on the land was there. So when you all, you and me and others, ran into Stefani and them working on the, um, the Green New Deal for Europe and had a care income in it, it was just a natural, in a way, continuum and really broadened what we had always been, you know, finding our way towards. We were talking a lot about the work we do in the home. But we knew and we discovered in the UN Women's Decade how much work, as you said earlier, Selma, women were doing to feed the world, particularly in the global south, in Latin America and Africa, you know, et cetera. The other thing, though, that I just want to highlight, and this is particular for women of color um, in the US, but also internationally, um, is the justice work. Yes. The justice work that women do, you know, uh, the U.S. has the highest rate of incarceration of any nation in the entire world, disproportionately black and brown, disproportionately impacted what the Black Lives Matter movement, I'm talking about the broader movement, not the specific organizations, after that horrific public lynching of George Floyd and the whole world rose up and said, absolutely no, Black Lives Matter. And really having to explain to some people that when we say Black Lives Matter, what we're saying is that if Black lives don't matter, the lives of none of us matters. And that's absolutely the case. There was just a, a, a case in, I can't remember what state now, of a white guy whose neck they sat on. And he was the first thing out of his mouth was, I can't breathe, right? So they come for us today. They're coming for other people tomorrow. But the work, so much of the caring, caring work that we do as women also is this justice work, not only on yes. behalf of our children who are in prisons, but the justice work that the welfare mothers uh, have done 
uh, for decades in the communities, whether it was uh, uh, the um, in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, in winning um, open admissions in City University or whatever, all of this justice work that we do that isn't valued and, and isn't counted either. And the thing about Clotel is Clotel was organizing with domestic workers. And so is and our so network is Peru. in Lima, Peru. Uh, are, are doing that, you know, count the work that we do in the home and the work we do in other uh, people's homes. And the, the um, what we launched on, on the 8th of March with this survey with women, I think from about 13 or 14 countries speaking out about it with Mai from, from Thailand, the woman from Myanmar talking about the importance of the care income and valuing the work given the great repression they're facing in uh, Myanmar, given what's happening in Thailand and other parts of, of the world. It's just the, the work of building this movement. So when we talk about 50 years, we're not tired, Selma. No. We're inspired, right? And we set out, as you said, not to discuss wages for housework as something we write about and theorize about. We wanted the money. And my late mother, to her credit, she always said, Margaret, I want my money. And then we would come to New York, to the UN, to lobby and all of that. We would stay at her, her place. She'd make everybody the famous Beijing codfish cakes and really encourage us, uh, encourage us on because it's our money. We have created it. We have created the wealth of the whole damn world. And we want our money back. We want the society, a, a totally different society focuses on the caring of people and the planet. And we intend to keep going until we get it. And I'm glad to see some of the young folks out uh, on here, the next generation of people that are gonna be taking up uh, this fight, whether it's the child tax credit or so much more. So Selma, we so appreciate what you started out to do and put forward in, when was it, 1972? In that booklet uh, that you did and the, the, the network that we have now uh, built together just wanted to lift that up and to thank you uh, for, for your work and to giving voice to so many of us, including me, people thought I was just some little village villager idiot, right? Not political, don't have much to say. As some of us like, I want to hear what she has to say. What do you think That's about right. this? What do you think about that? Okay. So she has found the way to give voice of so many of us. And that really takes a love of the people. It takes a love of the movement. It takes skill, delegation, dedication, empathy, and love. I wanted to lift that up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. I, I just, there are just a couple of things that have to be said. And um, one of them is that what has been offered us is a double day. And many of us have done that, many millions, but we're exhausted from that. And we're fed up that the children we fight so hard to feed, we have no time to spend with. And women are beginning to speak about that. And men too, and I have to mention Payday, um, a network of men in the US and the UK, which has stuck with us, which has fought good battles alongside us, which has, which has worked for prisoners, which has worked for refuseniks, those who refused to fight their wars were involved in another war now. Can I just say about that, that we hear the things that are happening, terrible things that are happening to people in uh, the Ukraine, terrible. And the same things happened when the US and the UK invaded Iraq, but we never heard about what was being done there to the people. Or when Palestine, when um, Gaza was bombed, we never heard that that happened to the, that's what they, the Palestinians suffered like that, worse than that, year after year after year, we don't want any country to, to face that. We don't want Russia to, the Russian women and children and men to be, to be killed by bomb. We don't want any of it. We want this, this way of dealing with the environment because it's really bad. You know, the military is the worst thing for the environment. 
that we have. And we are pointing also to the subsidies that are given to fossil fuels of all kinds, the ones that we are trying to abolish, they are feeding with money. So we don't want the double day. We want to have jobs that suit us, that suit our responsibilities, women and men. And we want uh, pay equity. And that's part of what a, a, a global women's strike movement for a care income would be able to provide is you don't need the job. You can take the job unless you raise the price per hour to a reasonable uh, sum. We've been offered the second double day as if that were a liberation, but there is no liberation through capitalist work. And we all know that what we want is a change in the world, beginning with caring, invest in caring, not killing, has been our slogan all this time. Right, Sam, so, so I forgot, I neglected to say, and Nina and others, that we have congratulations and greetings from the actress Mimi Kennedy in the US, an, an Irish woman, oh, wow. and some people in the US will um, know her name. She's still a working actor on television. I think she's in some series called Mothers or some, Mothering or something like that. And also the actor and activist, uh, Danny Glover, who is now tomorrow going to be receiving a special Oscar. They're finally recognizing him and wow. giving him an honorary Oscar. And he has been a friend. He's been with the Women's Center in London, England. He has been a friend and a fan for so very long. And he sends his congratulations on the 50th as well. Thank you. That's lovely to hear that. We, we remember him very well at Crossroads Women's Center when he came here and we had the events with him. He was great. Right. Absolutely. Can I just say, I just wondered if you could, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad, Margaret, that you raised all that you raised about the money. And I think you said your mother said she wanted the money. <laughs> was it your mom? <laughs> Anyway, because yeah. that's exactly how we feel in the Wages for Hustle campaign. In fact, you cannot join the Wages for Hustle campaign unless you want Wages for Hustle for yourself. We're not do-gooders. We believe in that money, that financial independence, that financial recognition for caring work. But there has been a lot of hostility to that. You know, all the way from Eleanor Rathbone, who fought yeah, for family yeah. allowance, you know, which Selma always, you always speak about her and we've done quite a lot of work on that. She, you know, she faced hostility to women, working class women getting mothers, getting money in their hands. And I know we're fighting for child tax credit now in the US. And the fact that, again, it's not specific that it should go to mothers and they've just cut it. And we are fighting to get it reinstated so that all mothers actually get it. But I just wondered, Selma, if you could say a bit more about that, because that is what we face with the care income. Stefania, who has been working with us, put a note saying, thank you for turning the care income upside down. And I have to <laughs> say that Stefania has been fantastic in fighting for the care income. And one of the things that she makes absolutely clear is that women need the money, that the women who are doing that caring work need that money. That's right. That's and right. The people, but there has been a lot of hostility, and I think sometimes people are surprised, from a whole strand of professional feminism, establishment feminism, to that. And I wonder yes. if you wanted to say a bit yes. more on that. I do, because no, I have it. worried I'm for right. years, why do they hate us so? Why do they oppose us at every turn? These are women who are producing the whole human race and taking all the time of their lives and fighting for other people and caring for other people. And these people, they will not back the mothers. They will not back the carers. And finally, it occurred to me, well, I have to tell you, it occurred to me today 
they don't want us to have that power because if we do, we'll turn the world upside down. We will refuse any money to go to war. We will refuse any money. The man who is making the budget, which is going to really squeeze us in the UK, that guy, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, is the richest man in Parliament. He's a billionaire and he's telling us how little we can live on. How dare he? We have a right as the mothers, as the producers, as the carers, as the protectors, as all who work for life, who, uh, as the growers of food, all who work for life and for the life of the planet. We have a right to an income. We have the first right to that income for the work that we are doing all around the world. And we are stronger after 50 years than we were in 1972. Caring is on the agenda. After this pandemic, everybody knows that the difference between life and death is often, very often the carer. You call the caregiver in the US, I know. And it's those who are ill at home, those who are ill in hospital, um, those who have, are caring for other people. And that caring, that is a relationship. We are saying that our relationships must be caring relationships. And this is how we, as the carers, are expressing our wish and our struggle to change the world and to save the planet. There isn't much time. We hope there is any time uh, at all because it's very touch and go right now. But we work in the movement to save the planet, partly because we struggle for the living and, and for all that live for the animals, for the plants, for the trees, for the climate, and for the people, all the people from the bottom up. And women coming together in a movement which is so strong and so soundly based, so much based on humane considerations, you know, that can do wonders, uh, we feel that we are part of a greater movement throughout the world for this planet and for th this species and for every species to survive for a better day. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Selma. Is, is there just a, a, a couple of minutes, Nina? Yes, yes, add something. yeah, I just wanted to thank you for that, for that, Selma. And I think part of um, the reason too that of, of this hostility, uh, Nina, that you raised and Selma that you talked about is that a lot of them have a skin in the game. I mean, I hate to put it that way, but they, they want, they are part of the, the structure of a prep that to use that term of oppression, if you know what I mean. And yeah. they, you know, they want to get in there and, and be like the guys, you know what I mean? And they need our work. That's what COVID exposed. They were shocked. A lot of the women in careers were stunned that they had to be home and take care of their kids because, you know, the nanny wasn't there, the domestic worker wasn't there, the low wage worker wasn't there because it's all that work that makes it possible to go out and then do that work. And then the whole lie that to be a worker, we have to be exploited in some job outside the home. And we want to get rid of exploitation. So there's some who don't want to get rid of exploitation. It works in their favor, including some women. And I think that's part of the reason for the hostility. I mean, the fight now around the child tax credit, you mentioned it. You know, there are those still in the mainstream feminist movement that want us to focus only on providing childcare, 
you know, outside of the home, we're not against people, women having childcare, but they would prefer to do all of the supports um, for, to make it easier for women, quote unquote, to go out and get a job as opposed to really undermine and destroy these exploitative uh, structures and relationships. And I think that also uh, tells us a hell of a lot about the hostility. We're really seeing that here. They're really afraid of women getting, getting money. And especially if you're a woman of color, you look at what happened when black women started claiming welfare. Then it was white widows who were getting in and it didn't seem too controversial. The moment black women started uh, claiming it, then it became something else and it became um, really uh, racialized. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, to mention and underscore that. And also the Poor People's Campaign, I do have to say that because we talk about autonomy. We talk about sectors speaking in their own name. The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, which the global women's strike, which is coordinated by Wages for Housework in the US is a national partner. So it's women of color in the global women's strike. They talk about when you lift from the bottom, everybody rises. And they talk about a fusion movement about the refusal to separate the various oppressions from um, poverty, racism, environmental devastation, the war economy, what they call the nation's uh, twisted moral narrative, because like King, it's kind of grounded in some of the, uh, you know, the faith-based groups, Bishop Barber and the Reverend Listeo Harris on that. But one of the things too about the Reverend Listeo Harris, she says, she popularized, I asked her, she said it came out from the welfare rights movement, take away our poverty, not our children. So the whole issue that we're also fighting on as part of this community and justice work is the scourge of children being taken by the state, put up for adoption, put in uh, foster care, not because of abuse, but because the mothers are poor. The primate, the grandma, is, is poor. And now you have a Senator out of West Virginia who is an oil baron who is saying in order for grandmothers who are caring for their grandchildren to get the child tax credit, they gotta go outside the home and get a job, excuse me? So I, I just also wanted to lift, lift up that uh, fusion uh, movement and, um, and, and, and really to say that it's no accident that we're also involved and part of that of that movement that's growing and building across the, the United States. On June 18th, they're planning on gathering 100,000 people in Washington, DC around these issues. And in the Jubilee platform that they've put out, guess what they call for? A care income as one yes, of the things indeed. in the Jubilee platform. Yes, indeed. That's right. Can I just also say that one of one of the things that has also come up is that some of the people who are associated with the old wages for housework of the 70s, the ones who left the campaign then and stopped campaigning, but have kept writing books. Anyway, they're they're claiming that wages for housework is symbolic. And the thing about <laughs> wages for housework that to us the cash was never symbolic women's poverty was real is real in fact we're getting poorer and that's what someone was speaking about oh. with the with the chancellor of the exchequer is that the poorest women are getting poorer and poorer and it's mainly single mothers and we are not getting support from the women in positions we are the ones who are having our children removed as you mentioned so there's nothing symbolic about it and that is the big difference between those of us who have been campaigning you know and those who use it as to debate you know a lot of people like debate yeah they, 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 they don't have time for that you know we don't have time for that i think what people don't understand about the wages for us for campaign and the global women's strike is the enormous range of activities and movements that we're involved in. And when you come to the Crossroads Women's Center in London, and I'm sure it's true when people meet you all in the US, and when the Crossroads Women's Center opens in Philadelphia, which is just now on Sunday, you know, people get, they get a sense of the range of things that we're involved in, the struggles, 
the different aspects of the movement that we're involved in from our own perspective, you know, starting with caring work and fighting poverty. Selma, you may want to comment on that. And I just want to raise that City of Women London, which is a whole project to rename all the stations of the London underground with the names of women or non-binary people who have made a big contribution to the city have named Selma for Kentish Town, which is where our women's center is based, which we were just hey. absolutely delighted by. Thank you. You know, um, it's really this question of how many struggles you're involved in. We are involved in the struggle to prevent children from being taken from, by the state, but we're also involved in anti-deportation. We work with the All African Women's Group, which uses our center and which fights for itself and each other. It's, we we use the benefit, we use the method of self of collective self help. We arrange we work with people who are in struggle and make it possible for them to express exactly what they want and say what they need and get publicity for their case and win time after time in all kinds of cases women are being put in prison for reporting rape because the police don't wish to bother by a draw arresting rapists mainly i think because they are rapists themselves that's a whole story that we are involved in in the uk and i know that the women in thailand there's a there's a human rights defenders where all kinds of women, women from the slum areas, women from the um, from the sweatshops, women on the land, women who are working in all kinds of jobs, women sex workers, together, a whole set of different kinds of women working together. And that's part of the strike. That's what the strike stands for. That's what the strike fights for. That's what the fight, the strike invites other women and men to be involved in and to be useful to. And that's what you do when you build a movement and you don't allow careerists and the ambitious to use your movement, movement but you make it accessible to the grassroots to embrace and be part of. And that's what we've been doing for 50 years. And I have to tell you, you get old with it because there's no <laughs> way of holding back time, but you're satisfied that you've been spending your life at something useful and important, and it educates you and it never stops interesting you. Margaret, it's been a great pleasure to work with you all these years. And I know we have a few more years to go before we win but we'll do it. Absolutely. <laughs> here, 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 here. On that note, I'm going to ask the people who have been monitoring the chat to see if there's anything they want to raise, any any comments or questions that people may have put there. Well, I mentioned um, a few. Yeah, they, there's many, many messages of congratulations, of thanks for your energy, for the uh, history of the, uh, you know, the account of this, history of this powerful movement. Um, lots and lots of people making comments like that. Um, people that were, have, were in the, the Wages for Housework campaign years ago have come on this event, a number of people as names I recognize, and are delighted that the campaign is making so much progress. And so to, towards a caring society where women's work is valued with real money. Thanks, somebody commenting on what you said, Selma, about uh, the many, many things that the campaign is involved in and saying, that's why I'm here. I came to the Crossroads Women's Center and you've won a supporter. People agreeing with what both Selma and Margaret said about poverty being central to our struggle. Uh, somebody from Winvisible, the Women with Disabilities group saying, concretely fighting for benefit rights and against care charges. 
people commenting on what you said about against the billionaires and against the gap between the privileged and those who deserve more money. And then um, somebody did raise a question about the Wages Due Lesbians Manifesto, which apparently is published in a book, Transgender Marxism, and asking if it's published elsewhere. I, for one, didn't know it was published in that book, and I'm very glad to see it because it looks fantastic. I had a quick look at the link. So that's definitely something that Wages Due Lesbians which is now Queer Strike will want to pursue. People raising that it's not just caring for children, it's also for aging parents. I know a lot of people have that um, experience. People very glad to hear what you said, both of you about personal ambition and against, against personal ambition and against separatism. A uh, lots of claps and cheers for that one. Also on the issue of autonomy, people laughing at what you said, Margaret, about the autonomy, having, taking our autonomy from men. And um, for, then also speaking for ourselves about the slogan, you recounted some and nothing about us without us. Um, people commenting on the issue of uh, the people that look like us, but are actually the state about the care income and how it relates to the environment, how it relates to having our children taken away, the issue of rape, having money in our hands will make us less vulnerable to the pandemic of rape. And then people generally loving the various slogans that have come up. Every mother is a working mother, invest in caring, not killing. And then finally, the one saying women don't, don't retire, they just tire. So yeah, very, very, very lovely comments and a very engaged kind of um, interactive audience. Nikki, there's another comment at the end from Maggie Ronin, who, who, is, an, who is an academic, our, our own academic, who is the Global Women's Strike in Ireland, who says those careerist academics are disgraceful, Nina. Not, not how academics should behave towards grassroots women who have done the work. As someone who is an academic and has been proud to be part of the Wages for Health work and the Global Women's Strike for over 20 years, I am disgusted by those academics claiming the hard work of grassroots campaigners that we've just heard, sorry, I've just heard, that we've just heard about and claiming that the demand for wages for housework is symbolic, outrageous. Like Margaret, my mother immediately loved the campaign. I was raised on welfare. And when I first heard of wages for housework, I thought straight away of my mother and why she needed, and we all need that money. That's the kind of academic we want. Can I just say there's one question here. My question is in, in a movement, how do you know the ambitious ones and how to deal with it without destroying the movement? I don't know if anybody well, has a good question. question. I think they make themselves very clear very soon. And if you're looking for them all the time, you'll meet them and it'll take you about five minutes to know who are the ambitious. They want to know where you get your money. They want to know whether they can represent you with this and that. They want to know who is in charge because they think there's something that they could get hold of if they get the person on top, but there's no person on top. And they look like the state. Now, I have to, I, I don't know how to explain this, but I know you, Nikki, and you, and Nina, and you, Margaret, you know what I mean. The state has a look. It's avaricious and it's self engrossed. And they don't tell you the truth. They look shifty one way or another. They, I, you know, I can go. I, anybody from the Crossroads Women's Center who's been there more than a year will be able to pick out any ambitious person in any crowd of a thousand. You know, they, they don't look like us. We look like we're serious and we look like we're straight in the sense of truthful. And they look like they're lying. Unless they're great actresses, in which case they should really get a job on the stage. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned lying, uh, Selma, because that's that's really a big a big part of it. And one of the things that we we touched on, but it's connected to this topic, is using the state against the state, because that is something that we 
that we have done. I mean, what the work we did in the UN was just was an example of that. I mean, the UN is no revolutionary organization. We all know that. We don't. We do very little these days. Although we do have a workshop coming up tomorrow morning at the UN Commission on on the Status of Women, because we did do that work over a decade. We want to claim our work and see how it how it has expanded. And on the question of academics, I'm so glad Maggie said what she did because they, you know, there's some useful work that academics can do on behalf of the movement. There's research we need, there are figures that we need to, to find out from us, from the grassroots movement, what is it that we need, rather than just taking our words and regurgitating it and claiming it as though uh, it came out of, it was their own invention and it didn't uh, come out of the, come out of the grassroots. So we, in, in the campaign, I mean, I, I could think of, some people in the US in the political class who have been helpful to us in relation to Haiti. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get in. I mean, I, I think of uh, 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 somebody like Congresswoman Maxine Waters. She's an elected official. She's been an elected official for God knows how long very dedicated to the grassroots in, in Haiti. She okay. is part of the political class. So we're not about to just trash her we don't agree on everything but we're not about to trash her and just say well we don't want to have anything to do with her look it takes a lot of ambition to become an elected official okay it really does so i think that when you are at the bottom and you're struggling for your life and you are very aware that you could be sold out at any moment you have to have your eyes in front of you behind you at the side of you all around your head to know where you're going and who you're going with, who you could rely on, who you can't okay. rely on, and who's likely to sell you out. We That's don't right. have the luxury of saying, we don't want to have anything to do with Maxine Waters in relation to Haiti because she's an elected official. We can't afford that. No. That, you know, I, I hate that word privilege, but that if there's one use of that word, it's got to be there. We and we have to know how to use the state against the state without becoming the state. That really takes being part of a movement. It's very hard to do that when you're an individual, a lot of individuals out there trying to do the right thing. And I know that a, a number of us would have been lost and get caught up in that if you don't have a movement to hold you to account, to say, wait a minute, what the hell are you doing? I mean, this person is helpful to us on this, but that doesn't mean that they are the movement. People get very confused about who is the movement and who is not. Look at what happened in the United States. They elected the first black president, Barack Obama. You know, he's no movement leader. He's a, a centrist Democrat, part of the capitalist class. Some people were mixing him up with being a movement leader and thinking, oh, we got the job done, we elected. No, I don't think so. So Selma, I think it's that, it's really the, the interaction and the discussions. My cousin, uh, Martha Prescott Noonan, who is one of those SNCC women and was in the South, you know, they were being shot at, killed, et cetera. And she talks about how they would try something and it didn't work. They would go back to the SNCC office and say, okay, well, that didn't work. What are we going to do now? And they would sit down and discuss it among themselves. And when we do events and we do evaluations and we look at what worked and what didn't work, that is so valuable in terms of building the movement, in terms of accountability, and also smelling the individual careerism as opposed to those who want the movement to win, who want the money for themselves. And I don't just mean money at the expense of other people because people get mixed up with that. Oh, you want money, you must be a capitalist. I don't bloody well think so because we know very well that if the caring of people and the environment are prioritized, it would do away with that kind of hierarchy as opposed to uh, reinforce it. So uh, I just wanted to mention that point about the state against the state. Yeah, that was, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. Yeah. Can I just raise something else that's in the chat, which I think is worth addressing? How do grassroots organizers like yourselves make sure their work is not co-opted and retain control over the, the message? 
when working with intergovernmental frameworks like the UN. Now, Margaret, you've answered that largely, but there is a lot of talk of, a, of, a, of an economy of caring now. You know, they talk a lot about caring. And we know that what they have in mind is not the kind of uh, caring that we are talking about and the care income. And Selma, I wondered if you wanted to say something about the care industry that's developing. Well, the point is that what, what these women are proposing is to professionalize care. They do not respect, first of all, the basic relationship of the society, which is the with mother child relationship they want mothers to be educated to be mothers excuse me we've managed for a, a, a millennium or two to raise children all of a sudden we have to get a college to a university degree in order to have a child and the purpose of that is for everybody to be caring for people that they don't particularly care about Whereas we begin at the opposite end, we begin about the caring that we want to do with people we do care about, which we are concerned to make sure are whether they're children, adults of any, um, or any relationship. And um, uh, the point is they don't want women to have money. They want to avoid, they want to build the care, the care in, um, industry, but they don't want us to have money and they don't respect the relationships that we want to defend with people we care about. We want, they want to have a material relationship among us. So nobody cares for anybody, thus caring as a job, and women are not allowed to raise their own children. It is quite a, a brutal a plan that they're putting forward. And it's not, it's not about caring, it's about treating caring only as a job like any other. Well, caring is not a job like any other. We give ourselves, we are concerned with the people we care about. And we hope that the society cares about us. Uh, um, and th those are the relationships that have to, that we, that we are fighting to establish. Yes. Looking for another industry that we have, we must, we must destroy the ways in which we as patients in hospitals and uh, students in schools that we are not we are not the purpose of it. We are an object of others' work that they get paid for. That's, that's capitalism. That's not caring. OK, we, yes, I, I was going to ask you, both of you, if you have last words, because we're, we're getting for five minutes to wait here for two hours of the, of the meeting. <laughs> Just to raise this one short question about uh, justice work whether anybody knows that that work in communities against oppressions is being measured. The, the person comments the only, the only thing they know is about time use surveys used to show gendered dimensions of domestic care work. Well, I think yeah, the community cool. work, I don't know of, of it being measured now. I know that we do have this global survey that hopefully the, the link is in, in, the, in the chat for that. Just very quickly, I don't know that these are final thoughts. It's just a shout out to my sisters in particular, but also brothers down in the Caribbean region that are giving Kate and what's her husband's name? Um, anyway, the royals that are down in the yeah. Caribbean right now <laughs> of the future king, giving them what for and saying, you know, take your gloves, silk gloves off our neck. Right. I just couldn't leave this without really saying what a delight it is uh, to see people in the Caribbean, including uh, Belize and Jamaica and other places, making our, our, our voices and wishes known and, you know, demanding what is owed to us 
from the royal uh, family. And Selma, you might remember my first trip to the UK um, and you were kind of taking me around and I saw the big statue of Prince Albert or whoever that was and I broke down and wept. Nobody in the car understood why I was crying, but you did. Because the wealth that we created in my little village and my little 14 by 21 island in Barbados created more wealth for England than the 13 US colonies, the royal um, family has gained from it, the working class in the UK, whether it's England, Ireland or Scotland, they didn't get it. They're all owed that money. And I'm glad to see those voices in the Caribbean region, those grassroots voices, lifting it up and letting them know this is not business as usual. You owe us and we're coming to get it. Thank you. Well, yeah, I want yeah. to speak about the Caribbean too. Um, I want to speak about the fact that they are, that Exxon is now planning to uh, prospect for oil. They know there are this many and this many gallons of, of oil and they will destroy the Caribbean. They will destroy the sea. And they've made some nasty deal where West Indians, where people from the Caribbean, from Guyana in particular, will get nothing from it except a destruction of the environment and a destruction of their lives and their health. And there are some people, many people who are organizing against it. And if people want to know more about it, we'd be glad to let them know about this movement in Guyana that we cannot allow to lose because we will all lose and the Caribbean from one end to the other. We haven't found any politicians. They may want to have the Republic, but they haven't yet expressed the view that they do not want oil prospecting in the Caribbean Sea, and that, that is terribly important. I think the other thing is that we, we haven't time to tell you the things that we have worked on and that we have won. And one of the first things we won after 15 years was making rape and marriage a crime in the UK. We have saved a lot of people with their help and, and the thrust that they wanted to make that these uh, people have been prevented from, we have prevented them from being deported. We have united children from Africa and other countries with their mothers in the UK who had to flee Africa, but um, could not take their children with them and they've now earned the right to stay and they've earned the right to bring their children so that they don't worry 24 hours a day, are my children eating, are my children well, are my children having, taking, you know, being cared for. And there is a lot of work that needs to be done every day at the Crossroads Women's Center in the UK in Philadelphia, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in other cities, in other countries. And we welcome all who want to work hard for changing the world. Every struggle is a struggle for the wealth that belongs to the grassroots, beginning with women and children, and including men as well. As Margaret spoke about the wealth that has been stolen and that many people come to the British, ex-British empire to recollect what is theirs. We want as a working class internationally, we want the wealth and we want the wealth of this planet to be safe in our hands as it is not safe in the hands of most of the people who own it and prevent us from really protecting it. That protection work is needed and it's needed now. And we have to build the movement to make a care income for all, for all who want to save the planet. 
save the world, save the soil, save the air, and save all the populations of all the species. That's our ambition, and it's necessary to do work to make sure that it happens. Hear, hear. Hear, hear, Selma. On those last words, I think we're going to close the meeting, but I like, first of all, you mentioned that we fundraise for Haiti, for the movement, the grassroots movement in Haiti. We also fundraise for the Karen Women's Organization, which is helping so many people in Myanmar who are, who are being bombed and who are escaping and hiding in the jungle. And they focus on women and children and all the people. So if you please look it up, Karen Women's Organization, they do fantastic work. And the situation there, the occupy, you know, the, the bombing, the militaries and there doesn't get anything like the coverage that we see about Ukraine day in and day out. Not that Ukraine doesn't deserve it, but so do all the other places where they're killing us in our thousands and where we are resisting. Uh, so Karen Women's Organization. Uh, also, I would like to thank the captioner who I thought, I hope people who needed captions have been able to follow that, Norma McKay. And thank all the people who have come to this event celebrating our 50th anniversary, including some former members who are here delighted that we're, that we're going strong. And to remind you all that tomorrow at CSW, we have a workshop. I think the details have been on the care income, the details and international workshops have been put on the chat. And also we have a launch of our archives at the Philadelphia Crossroads Women's Center on Sunday and also at the Bishopsgate Institute in London. And please don't forget to fill in that survey on what mothers and caregivers want, because that is the kind of information that we need to strengthen our hand in demanding a care income. So we hope to see you. There'll be many more events. As I mentioned, we'll have an international panel. We'll have a panel with younger members of the campaign for all those who thought that Wages for Us was dead in 1977. Come and hear from our younger members. And we're going to have films and all kinds of things. And the English Collective of Prostitutes Empower, the Thailand Prostitutes Collective, and the US Prostitutes Collective are also going to have a big celebration around October, November. So as uh, the other autonomous organizations. So there's a lot more to come. Thank you Thank very you. much. It's been really wonderful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Much. Congrats to all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>